right now on Sports Extra. The dogs did it. Fresh off their SEC championship win, Georgia got the top spot in the college football playoff. We're breaking it all down and previewing their Peach Bowl matchup against Ohio State. And it's deja vu. Another week, another one possession loss for the Falcons as the division slips further out of reach. How can they turn things around? Owen Brink got the key. Georgia Tech has the new head coach. What should we expect from the man in charge? That and a whole lot more coming up right now on Sports Extra. Yes, sir. Welcome on into Sports Extra, everybody. I'm Reggie Chapman. What a crazy weekend of college football championships all around the country. And now Georgia fans, you officially plans for New Year's Eve. Let's get right into it and allow me to direct your attention to this. No surprise here. The Georgia Bulldogs are the number one team in the college football playoff poll. They'll take on fourth rate Ohio State in the Peach Bowl right here in Atlanta on New Year's Eve. It will be just the second time these two teams have ever met. And you can bet it'll be electric inside Mercedes-Benz Stadium come December 31st. Thanks to the Beach Bowl, we look forward to being there. It's always an awesome event, and uh, it's grown from, from a long time ago, being small to being one of the best there is in the business. But it should be an electric matchup, electric atmosphere. What a great venue to play it in. Um, and it's really what college football is all about. I mean, these kids having an opportunity to play in a game like this. It is going to be insane. So I brought in two of the best, who I have sure have plenty to say here. We've got Jarvis Davis from Locked On in the house of 680. The fans home team, Brandon Leak, here to talk some shop. Guys, let's talk about the dogs. And I mean, how impressive that win was this weekend. Home team, I mean, for you, what was maybe the thing that I guess stood out and what was such a dominant win here in Atlanta. I think it was just more of the same. What stood out is that the dogs didn't have to do anything differently. They have been dominant from start to finish. They've only played in really two close games all year, and they found a way just to settle in and make sure they run their offense and run the plays they like to on defense. The 30 points obviously had a lot to do with LSU being behind, but they were in total control of this game. They fried up the 50 burger with cheese, and now there's no doubt that they're the number one team in all the land. The question will be, how healthy is the Bulldog team as a unit going in? How healthy is Lat McConkey? And will they be able to do the same thing? Run their stuff against Ohio State. Jarvis, it feels like this team only had to really get up three times this season. They had to do it against Oregon at the beginning of the year, and they had to do it against Tennessee, and of course yesterday against LSU. I mean, for you, what statement do you think was made with this win versus the other two earlier this season? that we can win an SEC championship because they haven't done that again since 2017. When you think about what Kirby Smart is, right, who he is as a head coach, and I think that a lot of times you talk about offensive-minded coaches and how those guys are great football minds. I think we need to start changing the conversation to over to the other side of the football from the defensive mastermind that Kirby Smart is. And he's a guy that has consistently been that guy and put out defenses when people all everybody coming into this season were, was doubting him saying that oh you lost all these guys drafting the first round on, on the defense side of football it's going to be a learning curve it's going to be it's going to be so many things they're going to have to deal with but that was not the case they have been dominant they got a linebacker that's up for the buckets award that's in those conversations and, and they and they were just dominant they didn't rush the pass as we as you must have liked putting the quarterback on the ground but when you talk about being sound and being te technical when it when it comes to running that defense that he likes to run, like Kirby Smart has done an amazing job, an amazing coaching job this year in 2022. You know, another person I think has done a really, really good job this year and did it last year as well is Stetson Bennett. Home team, me and you were probably the two founding members of the Stetson Bennett <laughs> fan club. He went 23 for 29, 274, four tutties, another MVP award for him. Kirby Smart was told by somebody that that might have been his greatest performance in a Georgia uniform. Where do you think that one stacks up? Uh, it's one among many. That is the third game of great importance. That's the third straight time he's won MVP in a game that had big magnitude attached to it. And he's a guy who runs the offense the way it needs to be run. Does he have 400 yards passing? No. Does he have 350 yards passing? No. But does he put his team ahead? Does he put the defense in position to pin their ends ears back? And does he have the ability to finish off a team early in the third quarter like he pretty much did against the LSU Tigers. The answer, yes, Stetson Bennett is just smooth, and hopefully people will just appreciate what they're looking at it be at looking at because once he is done, I think we'll see that we had a very special quarterback at the college football ranks. All right, Jarvis, you talked a little about that defense. LSU threw for an SEC record 502 passing yards against this Georgia team. I mean, they're going up against uh, Ohio State in the college football playoff. We'll get more into that game in a second, but how worried should Georgia fans be about that performance defensively? I'm not concerned because when you think about the time that they're going to have, be able to prepare for a guy like C.J. Stroud and all of those guys and Marvin Harrison Jr. and Nick Wood and all of those wide receivers that they have, all those guys going to the NFL. But when you give Kirby Smart 
a month to prepare or, or 30 days to prepare or, or in that time frame, multiple weeks to prepare for a certain type of scheme and what Ryan Day is trying to bring to the table, I'm not concerned at all because, I, like I said, Kirby Smart is a guy that we need to start having a conversation about him being the guy when it comes to coaching defense. All right, we're talking coaches. Let's talk about the new coach over at Georgia Tech. Brent Key gets the interim tag removed as the head coach over for the Yellow Jackets. A chance to lead his team, a team that he used to play for back in college. Home team, I'll start with you on this. What do you think went to that decision for Tech to go with Brent Key versus maybe a couple other guys that we were rumored to hear that would be taking the job? Well, there were clearly other conversations that were in the process. It was a fluid situation. I think it became a timing situation. You didn't want to wait too long. Uh, you want to get a new coach in front of kids before they get a chance to get into the transfer portal. You want to know what uh, you're going to have as far as a coaching staff. And so uh, was Brent Key the first choice? No, um, but it was a case where I don't think Georgia Tech or Brent Key should feel like they got something lesser than. He's a guy who was able to turn things around this season. The question will be, can he put together a staff and will he be able to recruit? He knows the type of individual it takes to be at Georgia Tech to handle the rigors of the classroom and be out there on the field. He's lived it, he's worked it, and now he's coached it a little bit for half of a season. Now he gets a chance to put his stamp on something I'm sure was a dream job for a long time for him. I thought it was really cool when they announced him to the team. The team erupted in years that seem to really really like Brent Keene he's a guy that really loves this school Jarvis for you when you watched him coach these games this season maybe what were you most excited about with what he did and maybe what he maybe was worried about like from a coaching standpoint right because we we understand what Jeff Collins brought to the table because he was a guy that came in with a lot of I hate to use the word rah-rah but that's what it was it was, a lot of uh, it was a lot of rah-rah it was a lot of hype it was a lot of motivational type stuff but when I think Brent he came in I think the first adjustment that he, he said he was going to make was figure out how to not get our punts blocked consistently because you know that was Jeff that was what uh, Jeff Collins was charged with and Brent Key said we're going to focus in on how to get this thing fixed and they were able to get that fixed throughout the season for the most part right they still had some issues coming down towards the end of the season but overall they fixed it and that's and that's what you want right there because those are the type of things that are going to motivate kids right not only you know with the Waffle House Cubs and the ATL and all that all that swag stuff right what's going to get kids on board is coaching like if you can teach me and it works those are the type of things that go a long way when you talk, talk about 18 to 21 year olds. Winning goes a long way as well. He's doing a little bit more of that than Jeff Collins was kind of doing. Absolutely. All right. Well, speaking of uh, winning or I guess maybe not winning, let's move to the NFL. Stop. You've heard this before. The Falcons lost another one score game this time 19 to 16 at home sealed by a Marcus Mariota interception. Coach Arthur Smith for the first time today says we might see some changes at the position with the bye week loading. Jarvis, we'll start with you here. Is it time for Desmond Ritter time in the A? Absolutely. Okay. It's been time to me. Uh, when you think about just the little things that Marcus Mariota wasn't able to accomplish, because there were some times where he had some some tar he was tar he targeted Drake London, where he had an overthrow on a comeback route on a two minute in a two minute drill going into halftime, and then also coming down in late in the game when you needed to make a throw, you needed to make a a good throw to Drake London in the end zone, and he just threw it overthrew him and he did that consistently that's the thing like when it comes to when you have guys like Drake London and Kyle Pitts obviously he's on IR he's not on the team he's on he out for the season but when you have those guys with that type of uh, wingspan that type of you know height 6'4 6 6'5 6 and, and, and able to just get those get those balls to those guys he just wasn't able to get it to them and, and it's a lot of times it's overthrowing him so it's just a lot of little technical things and mechanical things that Marcus Mariota just isn't going to get better at so that in my eyes this that's when you know it's time to go to the rookie home team it feels like fans are going to wonder if they make this change what took them so long to do it maybe for you what do you think was the thing that maybe changed Arthur Smith's mind about actually thinking about making the change there. Well, I think if you look at the last two weeks, the defense has played well enough for the team to win games. And it doesn't matter if you're the 32nd ranked team, the 15th ranked team, or the number one team. Your quarterback has to win games. And this is a team process, the way they've been running the football. But I think that's more about design, about uh, not having the pass protection you would like, knowing the limitations of your quarterback. But at the end of the day, your quarterback has to take you down the field on the last drive of games in order for you to win in the last two weeks 
We have seen this go the wrong way where Marcus Mariota has thrown interceptions and has ended that opportunity. So now you might be in a position where you're out of the playoffs. What do you have to lose? And now you need to see what Desmond Ritter might be able to do with some weapons, with Drake London, with some wide receivers, and with a running game that might be able to win you some games at the end of the year. This game was really kind of the sickos game of the week. I think there were seven field goals combined in this game. It was kind of a weird watch. I mean, for the offense, Jarvis, do you think how much of this do you think was actually on Marcus or does it speak to a bigger issue about maybe play calling or maybe the personnel this team has? I have no issue with the play calling, but you know, but today it, it was a little weird in the beginning because when you think about only rushing the ball for six six times for 28 yards in the first half and you, you throw it 16 times for a guy who we you have game plan for him not to throw the ball over 20 times. You know, your record is, is a lot better when he doesn't throw it over 20 times a game. So those are the type of things that that was kind of weird in the beginning, but as when it came out in the second half, you saw there was an emphasis on running the football, I think to a tune of seven straight times. So that's, Arthur Smith understands who he is and what he is with this offense with Marcus Mariota, Mario the under center. You're going to have to have a heavy run game if that's the only way you're going to be successful on offense. And I think that with him, Marcus Mariota being that guy under center, like you, you have to kind of stay under that. And as a play caller, you can get kind of stale with that, you know, and I think that Arthur, Arthur Smith wanted to kind of take advantage of some 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 passing deficiencies that from the Pittsburgh Steelers defense. You kind of saw that a little bit, but you can't do that when you have Marcus Mariota under center. I'm going to let you talk about the defense real quick. 19 points given up. It's pretty good. I mean, at this, at this point, how frustrated do you think they maybe are and how much do you read into that considering the opponent, of course? Well, I mean, two weeks in a row were the biggest moments of your season. If you beat Washington last week, you win the tiebreaker. You're still in the playoff chase. You win today, you make it even more uh, pressure that you put on Tampa Bay to stay out in front of you. And the defense has done well. It's two weeks. We've held a team less than 20 points. You're at home and you're finding a way to keep them uh, flustered enough where rookie quarterback's not coming in and throwing three and four touchdowns. They're kicking field goals. So I think that the, the defense is a bend but don't break. Defense has been that all year long. Uh, and they gave the team a chance to win today. When, you're, when you are holding a team to 19 points, you should find a way to score 21, 23, 25 points and get out of town at home with a victory. It's funny. I feel like that's the big thing over for the Broncos as well. They've got one of the best defenses in the nation. But unfortunately, I think if they can't get over 18 points, they can't win, and that's why they keep losing. The Falcons need to score more points, obviously, to get that done. We'll see what Jesse Murder can do. All right, coming up next, we don't have to guess anymore, everybody. We're breaking down everything involving the college football playoff and how we think Georgia and Ohio State will shake out. Stay with us. Welcome back to Sports Extra, everybody. The college football playoff is officially set. Georgia at number one, Michigan at two. TCU stays at three after losing the Big 12 title, while Ohio State sneaks in after USC folded in their title game. Home team, I want to begin with you with this. Georgia has been dominant all season long. We knew they would be to this point. We maybe didn't think it when we got into this season. How does this year's team at this point compare to last year's team at this point, both undefeated um, after finishing the regular season, after the SC championship? I think they are very similar, not the same. I think the negative is that this defense is a little bit more susceptible to giving up bigger chunk plays from time to time down the field, but they make up for them. If you throw a 30 yard pass, they're able to get a, a pass breakup or get off the field. And I think offensively, they're going to be a little bit in a, a much better place because they have experience now. They have been in games against Alabama twice, Michigan last year. Now they get Ohio State and they're going to be playing inside of Mercedes-Benz Stadium for the Chick-fil-A uh, Peach Bowl. So this is going to be a very mature, a very seasoned, and a very ready team ready to take the field. So I think the experience on one side and learning from, uh, you know, losing those five guys and win the first round and having a lot of guys play, that's going to have them real, well prepared, I think, to take on Ohio State, who's going to bring a lot of offense and a pretty good quarterback to the A. You mentioned uh, just being in that building. Jarvis, I think the dogs have outscored opponents 99 to 30 at Mercedes Benz Stadium this season. Both huge dominant wins. What is it about that stadium that has the team playing so well? It's a home game. That's a home, sta that's a home stadium <laughs> that's for the dogs, right? You know, they're very comfortable playing in Mercedes Benz Stadium because when you think about Kirby Smart and him playing at Georgia and, you know, and being in those conversations to go to SEC championships and, and you know, and, and being in those conversations like we won, won the last one time we won in 2017 and now they, got, they won SEC championship this year. So, like, 
they're very familiar with that place. And, and then we already know the Georgia fans are going to travel. And they don't yeah. have to travel far to get to Mercedes-Benz. So I'm not surprised at all that they're comfortable there. They dominate teams there. And they're going to be very comfortable now. And they're going to be very comfortable going forward because this is not the, definitely not the last time they will be playing in the, in the Mercedes-Benz Stadium for years to come. Home team, let's talk Ohio State. 11 and 1 on the season. Their one loss coming to Michigan earlier this year. We talk about comfortability. What makes maybe this Georgia team uncomfortable when they check the film and look at Ohio State? Well, you have a quarterback who's mobile, a quarterback who throws touchdowns, and wide receivers who can make plays down the field. I think it'll be imperative for Georgia to put a lot of pressure on him to move C.J. Stroud off of the spot. Uh, certainly, the sack numbers has been something uh, that a lot of people have talked about as dominant and as disciplined as his Georgia Bulldog defense. And we talked a little bit in the LSU game. You just don't rack up the sack numbers like a monster defense typically does. So making sure you move a quarterback off the spot and you saw what happened uh, when they played Michigan. You know, it can take one quarter to get them off of their A game and that's all the Georgia Bulldogs need if you're not prepared and you're not scoring touchdowns as they continue just to lean on you with their offensive line. Jarvis, it feels like when you look at it on paper, Georgia and Michigan are kind of similar in the regard. Really physical teams that like to run the football. They've got quarterbacks that can handle what they need to handle to get wins. Do you think that maybe helps Georgia, the fact they can look at the film and know that Michigan beat Ohio State? Or do you think Ohio State, after going up against a physical team like Michigan, might have a shot now? You know, to be honest with you, I think there's something that, you know, Georgia has to understand. Like, like you can't make those comparisons because Georgia is a lot – more talented than Michigan. Let's just be real. Like, let's be honest, because they're, you know, Mich obviously Michigan is is a good football team and they're a well-coached team. Jim Harbaugh, I've always liked him as a coach. So I think there, there is something there. Um, but I think that when you talk about what they Michigan was able to do, it's a little different because, you know, styles make fights, right? Because I think that Michigan was was bound to beat Ohio State this year. And, I, and it's, I'm not too, you know, shaky about saying that. But I think when you think about Georgia, like they're gonna beat them in, in, they can beat them in different ways. Like I think Michigan only can win one way. I think Georgia's gonna be able to run the football and they're gonna be able to get the ball in the hands of their playmakers. Like I obviously said, like Lad McConkey, hopefully he's healthy. And I think those guys and Brock Bowers, we know what he brings to the table. Michigan doesn't have a Brock Bowers. And I think there are gonna be some things that Georgia's gonna be able to take advantage of, not, but not necessarily Michigan will, will be able to do. I think if there was any questions about what this Georgia team could do offensively, they were all answered this weekend. They could score the ball a lot. Right. All right. Let's talk some NFL after this break. Coming up, the Falcons lost today to the Steelers. Still really stings. Maria Martin and our Falcons insider joined the show to break down what really went wrong. Hey, what's up, everybody? I'm Maria Martin here with our Falcons insider, Scott Barron. Scott, this one was pretty rough for the Falcons. It was a game that they really needed to win when we're talking about the playoff. We will get to that, but I think the biggest point here, Marcus Mariota struggling yet again for the Falcons, and for the first time in his postgame press conference, Arthur Smith did not say no when he was asked whether or not a new quarterback will be playing for the Falcons here soon. Yeah, and this topic has been brought up twice before yeah. and Arthur Smith has slammed the door on it. This time it's not all the way open. He didn't say Desmond Ritter is starting after the bye week, sure. but the door is open enough where it sounds like he and the coaching staff are considering it. He's not ready to make an announcement right after a loss, but I can understand why it's open a, a little bit because you've lost four or five. You've lost the last two on interceptions by the quarterback. You need clutch performance when the team is in one score game so often and they're just not getting it from their signal caller. Look, everybody knows when it comes to a quarterback, they get a lot of credit. They also get a lot of flack whenever yeah. things aren't going people's way. But Marcus really has struggled here lately. What's your assessment of what he was able to do or not do against the Steelers? You know, I think it goes back to what Arthur Smith always talks about with Marcus about the give and take, right? Some of these plays, his ability to use his legs and be athletic and extend opportunities really shows up. But then at times you look at passes that just aren't on the mark. And I think that maybe there's some frustration with that overall, I'm sure, including by Marcus. But yeah. you need more and greater accuracy when it matters most. The Falcons were down two scores in the third quarter. They surged their way back, not by third 
throwing the ball, but yep. by running the ball consistently. And then when they had to throw in these third and long situations, in good situational opportunities, they're not getting the uh, job done. Again, does that mean that he's lost his job? No, but Marcus even talked about being better on third down, being better in those critical moments than uh, he has been recently. Yeah, this was a game where in the first half they really did rely on the pass and then they switched the run, something that the Falcons know and do well, and things started to really progress for the Falcons in this game against the Steelers. Uh, Marcus is on his third team in the NFL. Yeah. Do you feel like this was the last opportunity for Marcus in this league? I don't know. I never say last because yeah. he was drafted number two overall and the guy has so much physical ability. And I think he, one thing, I know that the, the, the cries for Desmond Ritter are getting really loud. Sure. But again, the give and take, what this guy is able to do that nobody else can do is still special and it's still intriguing. And I think it's intriguing to Arthur Smith. I think they're going to go back and look at it as a Falcons unit and say, can he help us get to where we need to go, which is the possibility of, a, of an NFC South crown. But you have to evaluate what he's done recently. It hasn't been good enough. And the fact of the matter is you can look at stats, you can look at tape. Quarterbacks, right or wrong, are judged on wins and losses. And when you lose four of five, the questions will come about is it time. And correct me if I'm wrong, the last time we saw Desmond Ritter was in the preseason, correct? Yeah. Okay. Should be interesting. We'll see if we see him here in the near future. Let's talk about it really quickly. The playoff picture for the Falcons looks pretty meek now. What does it look like? I think they've got to win out or something close to that because wow. they're in it but not because of what they've done, it's because of what Tampa hasn't done, to be honest with you. Yeah. They continue to lose, and ironically, if T Tampa Bay loses Monday night and then loses again when the Falcons are on the bye, they can elevate into a tie in the NFC South without doing anything at all. And I think if they were in playing in any other division in football, get this, any other division in football, they're down at least three games, probably out of it. But hey, this is a unique opportunity. Can they take advantage of it? We're going to have to see. The NFC South is a disaster right now, <laughs> thankfully, for the Falcons. Also, we'll see what the quarterback situation looks like. Falcons going in on a much-needed bye week now. Could we see a new quarterback here in two weeks, Scott? We shall see. For Scott, I'm Maria Martin. We'll be right back. All right, finally tonight, Fred McGriff has been elected to the Baseball Hall of Fame by the Contemporary Baseball Era Committee. Five-time All-Star, nearly 500 home runs, won the World Series title with the Braves back in 1995. Well-deserving, a guy who played nearly 20 years. You have to wonder if hitting 493 home runs and not 500 was the difference, but uh, a calming effect, a guy who led with his bat and a leader through and through. Well-deserving, glad he got this honor. One of my favorite Braves of all time. I'm so glad that he finally got him in. Kudos to the Contemporary Committee for getting it right. And he was a unanimous selection. Meanwhile, Braves legend Dale Murphy fell short yet again. He'll have to wait another three years for the next bout. Guys, thank you guys so much for being on the show. Thank you guys so much for watching. Well, more Sports Extra next Sunday here on 11 Alive.